Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to Sussex Earlist Analysts and Hypermobility Disorders Group. I'm Jean Green, Chair of SEDS, and this is our fifth webinar. So hopefully we're getting a lot better. Um, that's not to say we we're too bad before, but um, definitely our, I think our tech is getting better. Uh, absolutely delighted today to welcome uh, Dr. Hazel Gowlin who um, completed her PhD in food allergy, innovation in advocacy research and training to support and protect those at risk at um, Kingston University. In 2019, she was appointed a visiting fellow in the School of Medicine at Southampton University and a member of the Seafood Knowledge Network expert group. She's an expert consumer, patient advocate, and has been working to reduce allergy risks and improve lives since 1994. She continues to work with a wide range of stakeholders to undertake research, deliver lectures and training and promote understanding. And we'll have all her links at the end of the webinar or on other bits um, on our website, you can see what she does and her research. So I'm going to, uh, we're going to have her presentation now, and then we'll have a Q&A later. So um, delighted to share the screen with you, Hazel, if you can do that. Brilliant. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. And thank you to Jane for this invitation. Um, I've got quite a lot of slides and I'm going to cover quite a lot of subjects and um, I've already had a look at some of the questions. Some of the questions will be answered in the talk and we'll have a look at the end and see uh, what else is still missing. And also afterwards, if you think you've missed something, I'm going to send Jane a PDF link for my slides so you can get them. And of course, obviously you can watch the uh, webinar again on the um, on the. Uh, website. So this is me. Um, when you do medical talks, although I'm not a doctor, not a medical doctor, uh, you have to put your disclosures, which basically is telling everybody all the things that you do. So I do quite a lot of lecturing and I'm on quite a lot of sort of expert panels for different things relating to food and health and food science and technology particularly interested in adolescents and young adults, have been doing some work, particularly in Europe, on researching what will help young allergic and asthmatic adults to make more out of their uh, clinical support. So this is me, a um, picture of me in the olden days, which is when the photos were black and white. And I was one and my daddy gave me a tiny bit of peanut butter on a little bit of toast and I blew up. And as it was the olden days, they fetched the doctor and the doctor came and gave me an injection and the swelling went down. And my parents realized then that they had a baby called Hazel who was allergic to nuts. It started with peanuts, but it went on um, with other nuts as I was given them in my childhood at the due season. Um, I had more reactions. So that's my background. And of course I was, we didn't know, but the fact that I had terrible eczema, my hands were falling to pieces, and eventually of course, asthma and hay fever were all part of the same story. Now my work falls into three areas. Um, advocacy. This is trying to represent the interests of people who are at risk from allergies, people like me with IgE mediated allergy and associated conditions. The anaphylaxis campaign is a charity that I worked with right at the beginning and I don't tend to do much for them now, but um, they are representing people at risk from anaphylaxis, a UK charity. And I've tried to influence all sorts of people to re re recognize the needs of us allergic people and to change things in our favor. I've done this partly by research, simple consumer research, going shopping, what, what do the packets look like? What's the information? What do we need? How do we get the writing to be bigger? Whatever it is. Um, I have two main research interests myself. One of them is supporting families 
and being available for families and also helping investigations if somebody's died, which thankfully is not that often, but of course devastating when it happens. And then whether regulation, food law and other law as well is adequate to protect people at risk. And then I support clinical studies. So quite often they need a, a, a patient representative, um, somebody to support the ethics. And of course, I've got quite a lot of experience now having done that for 20 odd years. And lastly, training, because to kind of earn a living in this area, in training environmental health, training standards, public analysts, doctors, scientists, uh, university people, and people in the food industry as well for quite a long time now, back, um, yes, since about 96 I started. So those are the three areas where I work. Now, I think I've got A to D in this talk. So this is a, the first section, and we're talking about food avoidance, but it's not just food avoidance, it's also food inclusion. So what do we know? Uh, understanding avoidance for different reasons for different conditions. So not just people with the risk of severe allergy like me, but caterers get inquiries about all kinds of things that people can't have, don't want, etc., trying to avoid. And so what do these consumers need? Now, living with food hypersensitivity, um, I've included hypersensitivity as the word that encompasses allergies like mine, IgE mediated, and also non-IgE mediated, which are different mechanisms. So um, you could say intolerances, different kinds of intolerance, and uh, celiac disease, which I will brush past briefly. So, possible it would be wonderful to prevent these allergies and there is work underway to stop babies becoming food allergic and it seems to work if you get there at the right moment and you persevere. Diagnosis, if you think you've got an allergy obviously you need to access optimal diagnosis. The doctors who do proper diagnosis in um, it, uh, are often finding that by the time people get to them, they've spent a lot of money on, should we say, alternative diagnoses, which are actually not very helpful at all and don't tell you anything that's helpful and possibly even jeopardize your health because you've been told to avoid stuff that you shouldn't really be avoiding. And that affects your nutrition. Then resolution. Now, a lot of IgE-mediated allergy in little children and other mechanisms will resolve naturally, it will just go away, but sometimes it needs some help and some therapy or some immunotherapy to make it go away. And then there's treatment. Of course, there's treatment to energy emergency symptoms. There's treatment to kind of keep a lid on everyday symptoms. And there are some treatments that may really change how your immune system works and make things a lot better for a lot of people for the future. But otherwise, essentially, it's management and management management, management by including food that you, uh, the, the foods that you need to have and by avoiding the ones that you shouldn't have. So it's both aspects. And that depends on access to suitable food. Now, Access means you can afford it. It means that you can get to a shop or the shop can get to you that's going to sell you food that will do the job and you're going to be able to have a, um, the skills necessary to prepare the food and you're going to be confident to make sure that you're getting the nutrition and the safe um, avoidance if you need to avoid. And that depends a lot on things like labeling, so food information, which the um, official channels called standards so that's what people tell you about the food what it says on the packet and of course safety which means we've protected this food from cross-contamination from other things that it shouldn't have in it now um, looking at ehlers loss and um, hypermobility disorders um, I have no competence here at all and you please must forgive me for making any errors in this area because it's not my topic at all. But I would, I've done a little bit of homework and essentially 
there are some physical and mechanical barriers that make things difficult for people with these conditions regarding food, which I think um, you probably will understand more than I do. And then, of course, essentially good nutrition and the right kind of nutrition and compensatory nutrition for things where you might need extra or your metabolism might not um, deal with it as well as other people's would. So those are challenges. And then there will be other conditions that people are living with just because they're people and people have all sorts of things to deal with. So I would suggest that those might be the headings for um, food. And once again, we've got to make sure that we're including what we need and we're avoiding what we don't need. And sometimes we have to avoid it in tiny, tiny amounts. And once again, we're talking about accessibility. Can I buy this? Can I swallow it? Is it the right shape, size? Can I afford it? Um, is it going to give me a proper balanced diet? Um, and then once again, you're dependent on the standards and the safety. So understanding food avoidance. Now we're looking here at all the different reasons. I train a lot of caterers. Well, I do normally, obviously I'm not training many at the minute and they get requests for people who can't have this and they can't have that all the time. And essentially I try and help them navigate. I can't have milk. Why can't you have milk? Well, because of this and this and this. Try and help the businesses understand the avoidance needs. Now, one avoidance need is that you just don't like it. And fair enough, there are quite a lot of things that we don't like. We don't like the taste, we don't like the smell, we just don't like the texture, whatever it is, but we don't like it. It'll do us no harm, but we don't like it. Maybe we're doing a diet. Maybe we're including certain foods, excluding certain foods. Maybe we're pregnant, we're trying to lose weight, gain weight, whatever. So lots of things to think about there. And we've got intolerances and intolerances tend to be more gastrointestinal. Essentially, either the food doesn't go down at the top nicely or it doesn't go through and out the other end nicely. Um, different mechanisms. And then we've got lactose intolerance, which is a specific condition caused by the absence of the enzyme lactase in the gut, which many populations and people lose um, in their lifetime or they never have it because of their cultural background. And lactose is um, a milk sugar that needs to be digested by lactase. And if you haven't got any, then you end up with diarrhea and upset tummy and so on. So you might be able in that case to have the lacto-free milk that will be totally unsuitable for many other conditions, including people with IgE mediated allergy. It's not for them, it's still got the milk proteins in. This is my kind of allergy. And of course, most kind of reactions are mild. They might involve, I mean, I look like this today because it's pollen season with sore runny eyes. Um, reactions are generally mild. You might have some itching, some scratching, a little fat lip. Um, most reactions resolve on their own or with minimal intervention, perhaps a cold flannel or maybe some antihistamine or something. But of course, where we're concerned is where they develop and become more serious. Uh, then we've got celiac disease, which is a very specific autoimmune condition, which I will talk about briefly. Um, that is a symbol, one example of a symbol for kosher. And of course, that is a religious diet with its own rules, as is halal. And then we've got vegan and vegetarian. So just some examples of the reasons why people are avoiding certain foods. Celiac disease is an autoimmune condition. It's caused by sensitivity to gluten, which is a protein that you get in cereals such as wheat, rye and barley. It's not naturally in oats. But oats are on the labeling list that we'll talk about later uh, because um, it's very difficult to get oats that are guaranteed without having had other gluten containing cereals planted in the field with them. It affects about 1% of the population in the UK. And the symptoms include short term, which is usually within a few hours, nausea and stomach upset. And then if you do not look after the welfare of your villi, which are the little sort of fingery linings of your gut, then you are more susceptible to bowel cancer in the longer term. 
there's a skin kind of version, in, uh, particularly affecting the face. And essentially the diet to follow is a gluten-free diet and the levels of avoidance will vary because it does depend on your immune system. But ideally you avoid the gluten in your diet and you stay very well indeed. And there's lots of stuff on the market now, lots of products which are slightly more expensive because they've been made in special factories with special controls out of slightly more expensive ingredients. And they've had um, precautions such as batch testing before they allow the ingredients in the factory. So people choosing and supplying food. Well, we start with the kind of basics in early life. This is the person choosing and supplying your food. And as far as we know, there's not a lot you can do to impact on whether your baby becomes allergic or not, except as the doctors will say, don't smoke and eat a balanced, healthy diet and keep yourself as well as you can. Uh, the same normally applies for breastfeeding. There's little evidence that some allergenic proteins can get through in the breast milk and can affect some babies. But generally speaking, if the mum has the food, the baby is not any more susceptible. There are tiny examples, tiny numbers of example where sometimes the mum has to start avoiding, say, cow's milk because the proteins will be upsetting the baby. But it's rare. Um, and then the big inter intervention that we now know about is, is in when you start weaning your baby, you start giving them food in addition to the milk. And this is an opportunity for preventing any allergy if they are the kind of baby who's likely to become allergic. That's not all the babies, obviously. That's only the ones who are very susceptible because of their family history or because they've already got serious eczema, for example. And of course, eating is a social thing. And um, considering how um, school, nursery, et cetera, manage this um, challenge of uh, food avoidance or um, making sure that the children with the allergies are included in activities and can participate as fully as possible is really important as it is in homes as well, because making and preparing food is part of growing up. And this is, I think, a grandma in this picture with a child. And food is, it can cause tensions in families when somebody has to avoid something in tiny amounts. So what do we know about prevention by early dietary intervention? Well, this is a packet of the Israeli standard weaning food, so the equivalent of a Farley's rusk or a baby rice product in this country, in Israel, is a corn snack, which is peanut. And from about four months, when the baby gets dribbly and starts teething and chewing and so on, um, this is the standard food that everybody has. And the doctors have worked out that by giving baby peanut baby's peanut at this age and continuing to give it regularly, it is protective against peanut allergy. So on the basis that the babies in Israel are not getting peanut allergy because they're eating peanut consistently from an early age all the time, not just once, but regularly. Uh, the doctors in London at in, um, St. Thomas's have tried this with other foods. So with fromage fray and boiled egg and peanut butter and uh, hummus and fish and eventually Weetabix. Um, and essentially these babies are at risk if they have eczema and the food is around in their home environment and it gets into their skin because that is the route to get the wrong kind of immune response and you will get sensitization. And that's almost certainly what happened to me. My dad would have been eating the peanut butter around in the home environment, but not giving it to me until 14 months, by which time it was too late. And the eczema broken skin and the dry skin as well, which we know is associated with a certain gene mutation um, are part of the story. 
On the other hand, if you start early consuming foods regularly in decent amounts, it can be protective against developing that allergy. Now, maybe it's too late and you have been sensitized. What can you do? Well, there is a way to supervise the consumption of the food in tiny amounts increasing. And particularly when you start with the allergen well broken down by cooking. Now, this is not like try this at home. This really should be done with medical supervision because obviously it is a risk giving a person food that they're allergic to. But if you think about a malted milk biscuit, the milk in that biscuit will no longer have the proteins in quite the form. And the egg in a muffin will also no longer have the proteins in quite the form that they are in the, in the natural product. So this doesn't work for everybody. There are some gastrointestinal side effects and we don't yet really know whether this lasts forever if you keep consuming, whether it will protect you for always, but it certainly works for small children. In some foods, it's difficult to get the amount in that you would like for the immunotherapy. And this is capsules of peanut flour. So basically it's just peanut, but it's been calibrated in tiny, tiny amounts and then increasing amounts over a period of time. It's quite expensive because you have to register it as a pharmaceutical product, but basically it's just peanut flour in a capsule. And um, it's being um, given in, in the various studies going underway now, and they're going to try and get it on the market. Um, this is another version. This is kind of like a nicotine patch with peanut that you put on and you have increasing doses over a period of time and you try to desensitize through the skin. So calibrated increasing doses of peanut flour in capsules for consumption. You just basically add it to your food every day, increasing amounts. And it doesn't work for everybody. There's gastrointestinal upset, so nausea, vomiting and so on. And we still don't know the long term story, whether that lasts skin patches and there's a trial also with sublingual drops because there's a lot of absorption under the tongue that can be a good place to do desensitization. So part B, allergy management. Now this is managing the condition if you live with it as opposed to the next part after this which is allergen management which is what happens to control the food. So we're talking about looking after the condition and the people. Now this is a pyramid for allergy. And if you start at the bottom with sensitization, there is no allergy without sensitization. The trouble is you never know when it's quite happening. I suspect I was sensitized through my skin, as I say with peanut, but you don't know when it's happening. And you, it means that you've got antibodies swimming around in your blood. And if you then encounter the matching allergen that goes with your antibody, whether it's peanut or bee sting or horse or um, pollen, whatever it is, um, then it's possible that a, a reaction may happen. Of course, the pink box says no symptoms. There may be no symptoms at all, or there may be minor symptoms. And as we move up the pyramid, you can see that the numbers re reduce. Um, anaphylaxis is the doctors will discuss this forever, but essentially it's when you've got a systemic reaction, you've got at least two departments in your body kicking off at the same time. So it might be your skin and gastrointestinal, or it might be cardiovascular and um, gastrointestinal, for example. So when you've got different parts of your body, respiratory, for example, at the same time, then that, that's anaphylaxis. Now, of course, it's not always fatal. In many cases, it resolves naturally. You have enough defenses in your body to sort things out quite often on your own without further help. However, if things become life-threatening, you might not be coping and you might need adrenaline. And the death triangle at the top of this pyramid should be minute. It should be very, very small indeed because they're relatively small numbers, but it would make the triangle look a bit weird if I made it that small and the word wouldn't fit in the box. So timing and treatment. Symptoms timing is very important. This is a medical emergency. If it gets serious, we're talking about adrenaline auto injectors. There's the JEX, the EpiPen and the Emeraid. 
And many of us are also asthmatic and would like um, a bronchodilator, a salbutamol ventolin inhaler um, to help us with our breathing during a reaction as well. So a posture really matters. Um, I'm going to say this again this afternoon. It matters that you have your your head and your heart level and your knees up because standing up suddenly, if your circulation is collapsing, it's enough to empty your heart and people will then collapse and die. So you must not stand up suddenly if you are having a severe allergic reaction or even sit up can be dangerous. Adrenaline auto injectors, it's called epinephrine in America, but it's the same stuff. An auto injector is something you can do yourself. Uh, you do it at the, on the thigh in that place that you can see in the photograph there, the picture. And you can do it through one layer of clothing. And the most important things are to get it the right way up and to hold it in for long enough. Managing your asthma, being on top of your asthma is, is important for controlling your reactions. And cofactors are recognized uh, if you've got a viral infection, for example, if you've just run or if you've already got uh, a lot of problems with the pollen season, for example, uh, PMT. These are things that can make your reactions different. Now, I um, have been involved in publishing data about food anaphylaxis back to 92 and work with all sorts of different doctors. And this is now a paper from Imperial that's just come out. So it's food anaphylaxis. Um, and we're talking about the number of people going to hospital. And the way that the government cuts the age groups, um, you've got the people at the bottom who are over 60 in the pink, you've got mainstream adults in the yellow, and you've got children 0 to 14 at the top. So there has been an increase. Maybe it's because of more awareness. We're not exactly sure why, but certainly there's an increase in people going to hospital. And of course, that is, that's a load of, that's an economic load on society. It's also a load of stress on society and on those families and those individuals. Um, this is a recent paper from the Charles Institute of Environmental Health. Um, saying that essentially uh, the number of people dying over 20 years has not gone up and that is true but we really do need to understand some of these reactions to work out what happened. So life skills, recognizing symptoms is important. Little children can often throw up and they get rid of it and that's that but of course over time as you turn to the top of the juniors and then into adolescence the symptoms may well vary. Um, sometimes it's just go to the loo and it'll fix itself. What I say is never go off on your own. And this is advice particularly for young adults. Always tell somebody where you're going and ideally somebody comes with you or hovers around. Take somebody, tell somebody, carry your auto injectors all the time. They are bulky and inconvenient and large and plastic and they're right nuisance, but that's all we've got at the minute. So we have to take them with us, ideally two. Get the instructions on your phone and get your friends to have it on their phone as well. That's quite important. Get the trainers, you know, the dummy ones that don't have a needle or a drug in them and practice with everybody. Make sure everybody's really familiar. Which end do you take off? Which bit do you stick in your leg? Hold it, how long? If you can, do the second pen in a different leg because the vasodilation will have started if you do it in one leg and then you want to perhaps put the other one in the other leg so that that one is all open and ready. And that is the posture in that photo for anaphylaxis. So head and heart level, knees up. You do go to the pub and you do sit down and feel a bit better. Don't stand up. Don't stand up suddenly. Just roll on the floor if you have to keep level. Prescriptions for adrenaline have gone up huge numbers. What's that? Four times in um, 20 years. So mainly, I suppose, awareness. But that's how many people are carrying them now. Lots of people are carrying adrenaline, not necessarily using it, but having it ready. Avoiding food allergens, we need to read the signs, we need to talk to the staff, 
Some of us are more prepared than others to put up with a minor reaction. You can see this child has a fat eye and he's obviously perfectly fine and that reaction may just go away. So it depends on your tolerance of reactions. Essentially, you need to know what to avoid, you need to know where it's used, you need to read labels, talk to staff, sometimes find substitutes, look stuff up online, particularly because you can read the writing better online sometimes because it's bigger. And if all else fails, then you have to be ready to manage any symptoms. Socially, particularly young adults, it's ideal if you've got a, a peer support, somebody that you trust, a confident, competent friend, first of all, to help you with the avoidance. You're not going to eat that, are you? And secondly, to uh, help you with any reactions. Where's your pen? Phone the ambulance, etc. There's a denial of risk. Many of us, of course, live with risk, and many of us break our own rules. Um, and that's life, that's what happens. We might be busy being a vegetarian and might not realize that the vegetarian option contains the thing that we're not allowed to have. We have to be ready to manage emergencies. All right, so now we're going to talk about the actual food, so allergen management. Allergen risks and controls and precautionary allergen labeling, which is called PAL, which is basically may contain, you know, we didn't put it in on purpose, but because of where we've made it, there's a chance that this other food might have got in. And then free from foods, which are a special part of the market. The food businesses, manufacturers, and the people who support the manufacturers and check um, the auditors, the people setting standards, the environmental health, the trading standards, um, all those who are supporting regulation, making sure things are done properly. The chefs, chefs in training there, um, information that comes with displays, what's on the packaging, what's on the shelf, is it adequate, can we find additional information through another route, um, talking to staff in restaurants, taking orders, and we pack manufactured foods. There's just some snapshots of food businesses. These are also food businesses, school meals. And often they're very, very good at this. And they have what I call a captive clientele. So they're looking after the same children all the time. And they give up quite a lot of time and energy to try and help support these children when they can. But it is risky because these are often quite high risk children with a catalogue of different allergens that they're not allowed. Their homes, um, so all through life, your allergy risk will possibly change and people do develop new allergies in older life. And of course, this is a, an airplane meal, but any food, anywhere, anytime, um, needs, the person needs the right information and they need to know that it's been made in a safe way. You may have heard of the 14 allergens. These are on a list in the law, which is, it was European law, it's, it's UK law now. These are the foods that have to be highlighted in the ingredients list. So you've got peanut over on the left, and then the eight specific tree nuts, and you've got egg, milk, sesame, shellfish, fish, etc. Um, big numbers for nuts and peanuts, medium numbers for egg and milk and so on, tiny numbers for celery and so on. But this list was made up at the request of different European member states and the relevance in the UK population is not always that clear. Um, here we are, the 14 allergens, and this of course means that when you're looking at a label, these are the words that are in bold or in a different colour or capital. In catering, you might, you might be using a, what I call the matrix, which is essentially a grid with the dishes on the left and then ticks for what we put in on purpose. So this dish has got milk in or egg in or whatever, and actually a little star for if it's may contain. So that's one format for doing that job. The information needs to be accessible, so the writing has to be big enough. The size of the writing on packets is regulated. The little X has to be at least 1.2 millimetres. The only exception is where it's a tiny packet like chewing gum, where they're allowed to make it, I think it's 0.9 millimetres. 
uh, we're the people that need to pay attention when there's a sign on the counter saying, please talk to us. The 14 allergens we need labeling on the factory made products. Uh, the 14 allergens information needs to be made available in catering on request. And everything needs to be consistent. There's nothing more scary than looking on the menu and finding that the dish is slightly differently described from the folder, which is slightly different from the website. And we also need these signs to get people to ask. It must be consistent. That's an allergy menu from, I think it was a long time ago. Um, and all the allergens per dish are listed. And then there's a little may contain for some of them. So that's not the standard menu. That's the one you get if you ask. I would say that there are other allergens that are more important. Um, kiwi allergy is huge. There are probably more people allergic to kiwi than there are allergic to fish in the UK, bananas, and then all the legumes. So peas, beans, lentils, uh, chickpeas, etc. And the trouble with those is that they are part of the plant-based diet. That's where that's where food is going at the minute. Lots of schools have, you know, meat-free Mondays, for example. Um, here we are again, the other allergens. So chickpeas, lentils, legumes. These are the fastest growing as far as I can find out. It's difficult to know. Peas, for example, pea flour is a protein which is used on other products. These are chips from Marks and Spencers. And pea flour is obviously sort of busted on them to make them crunchy. There are lots of families now that um, I see on Twitter. And there's a hashtag which is stupid peas, which means now peas have turned up in a place we weren't expecting, another place. Pea and bean flour in bakery items as well. Now, Isabel Skipler, Dr. Isabel Skipler, is a research dietitian at um, Imperial and the Brompton. And she is wonderful at doing detective work with people, particularly well, adult patients who've had allergic reactions to mystery things. And she says there are some lifestyle concepts, for example, the idea of health and fitness and smoothies and protein shakes and so on and so forth, which are causing people to report reactions. And one thing is that exercise um, at the same time as consuming certain allergens or um, certain big proteins can make your symptoms quite a lot worse. Um, the food and exercise culture, there's lots of promotion, there's lots of marketing about the health giving properties of these various foods, and particularly things like meat substitutes, so um, basically plant-based legumes, that kind of thing, or wheat substitutes. Uh, buckwheat, for example, is a wheat substitute which is um, widely used in Korea and Japan and is actually top of their list. It's one of the most um, uh, common allergies that they have there. And then supplements as well. What's in that extra rich protein shaky thing that you're adding to your smoothie? So she's spotting that there are some trends that are causing new allergies and also reactions in people who would otherwise be able to eat them, but the exercise made it worse. And we need to understand this a bit more. So looking at plant-based foods or vegan foods, this is a label. I have to say it's a nightmare label. I took a photo of it in a freezer in a college. And it's got, I think, 136 words. Now, whatever your ability is in reading, and of course, many caterers don't actually necessarily read that well. Um, you can see there are lots of words. The label is badly pasted around the corner of the box. But you can see things like kidney beans and turtle beans and butter beans and so on. But also how complicated is that? Now this is a jackfruit burger. So it's one item that, you know, a box of back jackfruit burgers. At the bottom, you might be able to see it says may also contain tree nuts, peanuts and sesame seeds. So it's got a may contain hasn't actually got any of the 14 allergens in it, but it's full of spices and seasonings, I think. One of these was smoked water, I think. Anyway, the point is it's complicated. It's a very, very artificial, ultra-processed, complex product. And yet when you buy it, you or when you eat it, it's a burger and that's it, it's just a burger. 
So all of those allergens are not on the top list, but black fruit has now been identified by Isabel Skipula, amongst other people, as a potential problem. Kidney beans, buckwheat, black turtle bean, etc., and the may contain this there. This is a weight goes equivalent. There are quite a lot of words in that list, aren't there? Quite a lot of words. 89 words in that list. I mean, they are things you mostly understand, although I don't really know what smoked water is. Smoked salt, dextrose, monohydrate. So it's this vegan food, this plant-based food is not always as simple as we might think. I mean, even if you compare it with a beef burger, beef burger, good quality one, has six words in the ingredient list. Um, Lookalike meat is a challenge because, of course, we don't want any confusion. We want people buying things and asking for food that they understand. Now, if a, a plant-based burger is made to look like a meat burger, then obviously it has the chance of misleading, especially if you end up consuming all those things. And if it looks like that, it's made deliberately to look like a meat burger and it's served in the way that a meat burger would be served but it's not meat and I use this photo because obviously that is not a burger that is actually a chair. So alternatives to milk another issue because the people who make this stuff are meeting quite a lot of need but not always the nutritional need you won't necessarily get the vitamin d that you need you won't get the other nutrients that you might need but the particular issue at the minute is that many of the suppliers are desperate to call their product milk and milk is a legal word it's a four letter word in the labeling legislation and you can't call your product soya milk or oat milk or whatever and yet the people who make this want it to be counted as as if it was milk um, and also some of these um, foods, uh, this is Professor Chris Elliott at Belfast, there's a massive difference in the bioavailability of micronutrients from natural sources and those as added as products often sourced from the Indian and Chinese chemical industries. So some of the ingredients in some of these plant-based foods are actually not really very nutritious in the form that you get them. Um, this is another consideration. Uh, this is a researcher from Canada and a researcher from Sweden. And they're saying that if you want to do a plant-based diet, so if you're doing veganism and you've got allergy, then they kind of contradict each other to a certain extent. There's a risk of nutritional deficiencies, particularly during childhood, um, comorbid, comorbid diseases, so asthma if you've got food allergy, means that you might need more energy and more nutrient requirements which are not made available in a plant-based diet necessarily. Um, and these diets have got limitations, both the food allergy diet and the vegan diet. So the need for dietary variety and or increased consumption to, to re reduce bioavailability of the nutrients in the food. And they did an experiment in children. I don't think these people have got any ax to grind. I don't think they're pay, uh, paid for by the meat people or anything. I think they're just doctor scientists. But essentially, lots of these nutrients were, were insufficient in a plant-based diet for children, far more abundant in animal versus plant-based foods. Another challenge is the constant source of uh, sourcing of new proteins, um, looking at, for example, insects and uh, this consumption of insects. These are snacks with uh, crickets in them. And if you have a shellfish allergy, that might cause you problems. And you might not be aware of that. So you might react the first time you eat a cricket snack, maybe. So controlling allergens, washing your hands, checking that what you've bought is exactly what you thought it was in a catering scenario, perhaps quarantining something until you've checked it, keeping all your information, as I showed you earlier on the matrix, cleaning down effectively is really important, making sure that your dishwasher is not overloaded with gunk and it gets well cleaned out and the stuff gets rinsed off before it's put in there and the temperature's correct and the products are correct. So allergen segregation 
The same applies in factories as it does in catering. So sometimes time is the thing you need. You need to do something before or after something else. Uh, you might need to do it in a different space. You might need to clean an area down and work in a different area. Um, cleaning and washing are obviously ways of controlling allergens. And then maybe you cover it by wrapping it or packing it so that it's not going to be susceptible to cross-contamination. Some of these pieces of kit, look at that uh, big mixer on the top left corner there. They're quite complicated and they take time and they need allergen validation and verification. So we've checked out how to clean it. We know how to clean it so that we don't need to um, have a may contain on our product, but we make sure we do that. We, we make sure we do that every time. So where did the allergen risk arise? When you see a may contain on a packet, was it something that came from the field? Was it something from primary production that they grow turmeric in the same field where they grow peanuts or next to it and it shares transport? Maybe that's where it arose. Maybe it was fine until it got in the factory, but we've got stuff going on in the factory, which means that you're going to have a possibility of cross-contamination, which we are unable to control at the moment. Maybe it was fine until it got back in, into the uh, until it got into the back of the um, food service, the catering operation, and suddenly we've got uh, not much room and tight kitchens and lots of potential for cross contamination there. So understanding where this allergen risk arose is quite helpful in understanding whether you um, whether you need to label with a may contain. So let's simplify this. If you're making something like um, a sauce in a jar, then obviously that's a wet product and the cleaning for that product will be basically the same as putting it in the home dishwasher. Um, and if it goes down pipes, then hopefully you can um, design the equipment so that the um, product can be swished through by hot water and detergents and so on and carefully designed equipment so there are no nasty corners to retain residues um, and if you can do all that you can run all sorts of things down that line you can run this sauce with just tomato or you can run one with the milk in it or with perhaps almonds in it if you're making a curry sauce or a fish sauce or something but you should be able to clean and verify and validate so that you don't need to have may contain on that line if you've got really good design and all the proper controls in place. If you're making the brand leader, then probably you're going to be running that line night and day and you won't have any spare capacity. You'll just want to run that line and make it work for you. On the other hand, if you're making something like this, um, which is crackers or cereals or something a bit sort of gritty and seedy and with particles that are going to drop off. If you're going to make the main, the brand leader, then you might well have a dedicated line for, for example, making the Jacob's cream crackers, which are the brand leader. You can perhaps run those night and day. But if you're going to make the cream crackers for Sainsbury's and then Tesco's and then the co-op and Asda or whatever, then you'll be doing changeovers. And if Asda have a different recipe and want you to put some other seeds in them or something, you can see that running those lines involves more faff, more changeovers, and you're more likely to have the possibility of cross-contamination if they work on the same lines. So some segregation may be possible. You may be able to schedule which ones you do first. But the trouble is that things like seeds and grains and powders are easily transferred across to other items. And that is where you're more likely to get may contain labeling and really you should take notice of it. I have been in the cream cracker factory and I have seen the sesame crackers and the sesame seeds jumping up and down electrostatically um, from one product to another and things in ovens as well. I've seen in catering where seeds jump around in the ovens and stick themselves onto other things and onto the uniforms. Lastly, I've put an example here of chocolate. Chocolate has particular problems because the cleaning that you do in chocolate factories, generally speaking, doesn't involve the sort of cleaning that we would understand with water. 
because water in a chocolate factory makes the possible biological microbiological risk um, so bugs and the chocolate will be what they call bloomed which means it's not shiny on the top it's kind of fuggy on the top so they really don't want water in chocolate factories therefore they push a big chunk of like, some fat or some waste chocolate so chocolate off the wonky ones um, down the line and it's supposed to pick up the particles but it will not necessarily pick up chunks like pieces of nut or whatever you can see there's a piece of nut in that photo that's a piece of hazelnut in a plain bar that had obviously come off from a previous production run and stuck itself into a plain bar of chocolate. Um, and the other things that you might find in chocolate, so peanuts or wheat or milk in a powder or liquid form will be uh, very likely to be disseminated and land in future um, product runs. So I take a lot of notice of may contain on chocolate. Um, this is um, a, a may contain label. Uh, you can see here it says uh, what the ingredients are, and it's essentially milk, but then you can see for allergens, see ingredients in bold, fair. May also contain nuts, egg, and gluten sources. So those are three allergens that might be in this product. Now, this is important because it's not just how much is too much. So how much of the nuts or the egg or the gluten might be left in that bar, which will depend on when it went through the line. But it's also affected by other factors. This is a study called the TRACE study. And essentially, adults in the UK, aged between 18 and 45, were given um, up dosed chocolate, pots of chocolate mousse. So you start with a low dose at the beginning of the day and gradually through the day, they give you the next one and they give you the next one and they monitor your symptoms. And you do that on four occasions, four different days. And they see how much you can have before you get any symptoms. But they make you come back and do it under certain other conditions. So you can see there's a picture at the bottom in the middle there of somebody lying in bed. And that's because they had a study where a day where they um, invited the people in the night before and kept them awake most of the night. They only let them have two hours sleep. So what impact does it have on your threshold to how much you can eat? Um, if you have been kept awake half the night, you know, that sort of stress. And the other intervention that they had was to get on the exercise bike between the pots of chocolate mousse and do quite serious exercise and then go back and eat the chocolate mousse. So how much does it change the amount you can eat before you have trouble, before you get symptoms? And how much does it affect the gravity of your symptoms, how fast they progress? So the top paper is the effect of sleep depriva deprivation. But there are other papers from this study which are more relating to the um, exercise and the impact on symptoms. Now they talk about EDO1 and EDO5 and that means eliciting dose, so that's how much of the allergen would impact 1% of the population and how much of that allergen would impact 5% of the population. So when they're doing, they have to do it at population level for setting these sort of levels of may contain this, if you like, and um, whether to withdraw the product or put a may contain or whether to just let it go, because it'll be fine. Um, but that's what they're using for the population. But of course that depends also on having accessible, which means affordable and available analytical detection methods. So can we find the level of peanut in this chocolate and the different matrices that means the different kind of foods so I've already explained that you've got the jar sauce which would be one matrix where you can wash it you can clean it out you give it a good rinse and you've got the crackers where the matrix might be a bit oily and a bit bitsy and you've got the chocolate which is definitely very fatty and a bit clingy and you get stuff in the factory that might drop off so those are called matrices different forms of the food where the cleaning is different and the analytical methods are different uh, this is a picture the top row 
Now I'll give you that little circle there on the right because that's a centimeter just to give you context for the size of the pots. The top row is EDO5. So that's the amount of that allergen that will give symptoms to 5% of the people who are allergic. So 95% of the people who are allergic to those foods could eat that amount and not have any trouble. The bottom row is the amount that will affect 1% of the population who are allergic to that foods, that food. And 99% of the people who are allergic to that food could eat it without any bother, just to give you an idea. Free from foods, totally different idea. This is where, because you can't eat wheat, you would like some shortbread made from a flour that's not wheat, or you'd like um, some pasta that's made from corn instead of wheat, or you might like some um, milk alternative that's not milk, so the soya or the uh, rice or whatever. These products are made deliberately as alternatives to the standard version, if you like, and prevent cross-contamination from them. Now, they're expensive because the alternative ingredients are a bit dearer anyway, but they're also expensive because they're not going to let that stuff into the factory until it has been tested batch by batch. And it's called positive release. So you're not coming on our site until every single batch has been tested. And of course that makes it a bit more expensive, but there's a huge market and a lot of it is um, very suitable for people following even quite strict diets. You have to be careful because you have to realize that all free from is not free from everything. Um, this is a, a sign in Morrison's, I think it was, gluten-free, wheat-free, milk-free. Well, not everything is free from all the things and it can be quite misleading. Uh, we had a big night and I think this is the chocolate bar that he had and he was allergic to milk. Now that says gluten-free, so therefore it's in the free farm section, coconut milk chocolate bar. Well, I think that's extremely misleading because the word milk on there means it's got milk in, but it could be coconut milk, which is not the same thing at all. And I think that's probably what happened. This is a photo that I picked up on social media. First of all, learning from research. So this is my work. Um, UK fatal anaphylaxis suspected or confirmed from food allergies since 1988. I've been collecting data and in some cases supporting families and coroners. Um, and then the other part of the work is investigating and recording near misses and other reactions and complaints. So when people have had a reaction and they wanted to know what caused it. So that's another story as well. So in that case, supporting the consumers, working with the regulators and learning from and advising businesses. So those are sort of two umbrellas of the kind of work that I've been involved in. And here are some publications. Now, at the end of this, I'll make sure that you can have these slides in PDF. So if you, if you wanted to look up any of the references. So we've got the fatal cases and the other near misses and so on. Um, in both fatal and the near misses, quite often there is actually no avoidance. The person was not actively trying to avoid that food, um, either because they didn't know or they never thought that they'd eat it on that day. There are lots and lots of reasons why people are not actively avoiding the food, mainly because they didn't realize what exactly it was or that they were allergic to it. Sometimes they're avoiding the wrong thing. We have a thing called cross-reactivity where, for example, you heard about kiwi. Uh, if you're allergic to hazelnut, you've got hazelnut antibodies in your blood. They're a bit similar. Uh, to, to so they will lock into kiwi perhaps certain ones there are lots of other cross reactivities where you have uh, the allergen and um, some antibodies that will sort of nearly recognize each other even though the foods might not have much connection lots and lots of people in the northern hemisphere have birch pollen sensitization. We're the people who are crying at the minute because all the silver birches are dropping their catkins and we're sniffing and weeping and so on. Also alder and hazel. And many of us have food allergies and including one called oral allergy syndrome. Now that means you might be avoiding a certain food that, uh, so you might not be avoiding a food that you should be. 
Maybe there's a mistake. Um, we had one case where the uncle came to stay and he gave the boy cow's milk in his special cup by mistake. He didn't realize that that was the boy's special cup and um, the boy drank it and died um, instead of soya or whatever he should normally have had. Um, sometimes it's a mistake by the food business. They haven't kept the information correctly. They've served the wrong plate to the wrong person. And sometimes it's actually almost deliberate fecklessness by the business. They've been told that they need to do something and they've taken no notice. So you can see there, there are lots and lots of reasons and trying to classify them is actually quite difficult. Um, looking at which food, now these are the new data from the um, new uh, BMJ paper that I mentioned earlier. Uh, in children under 16 on the left, you can see that 26% in the blue, so that's a quarter of children who died, died from cow's milk protein, and 29% died from food, but we don't know what exactly it was. And in adults, the right-hand side is the purple peanut, and the yellow is tree nut, and the pink is unidentified nut. So you've got uh, half, more than half of the adults uh, seem to have died from um, uh, nuts or peanuts. But you, once again, you've got 26% there, a quarter of those people, adults, who we don't know what they died from, it just looked like food. 5% of the adults in blue at the bottom uh, died from milk allergy. That is alarming because milk allergy has tended to be an allergy of early life, which is often outgrown. And these are young adults whose allergy had not been outgrown and who got caught out. Three 15-year-old girls, uh, Chloe Gilbert in Bath was allergic to milk. Milk is used in the form of yogurt to bind the meat which goes round and round and round in the donor kebab shop. It's sort of reconstituted together and quite often yogurt is in it or, and or soya. She had no idea and the food business didn't have any information to give her, even if she'd asked. Natasha Ednan Laperouse had a baguette which was made with uh, sesame seeds ground up in the flour. So you couldn't see the sesame seeds. They were just um, embedded in the baguette. And she was allergic to sesame and you probably heard about that case. This is Megan Lee and she was 15 as well. So three 15 year old girls. She was allergic to peanut and she ordered some Indian food on a just eat order from a local business. And there was peanut prevalent in most of the food that she bought, uh, even though she and her friend had tried to declare a nut allergy through the um, Just Eat website. You might have heard of Natasha's law. Now, it's quite complicated. Essentially, it affects a certain status of product. There are three sandwiches in this picture. There's the one in the packet with the word go on the front, which is from a factory, which will have full ingredients and allergens as it would from any other product from a factory. There's the sandwich in the box, which has been made to order. So somebody's come into the shop and said, please make me a tuna and salad sandwich. And they've done it in front of them to order. And there's the one at the very front with the stickers on, which says cheese and tomato. And it is the one at the front which will be affected by the law, which is changing as uh, following what happened to Natasha. Now, the one at the front is called pre-packed for direct sale. So if business is making some sandwiches out the back because they know it's going to be busy later and they want to wrap them up and label them, put them in a chiller so people can rush in at lunchtime and pick them up and go quickly. They will in future have to put the name of the product, the full ingredients list with the allergens highlighted. This is the guidance from the Food Standards Agency. So that cheese and tomato at the front will need a proper label with all that information on it because but because of what happened to Natasha. And the same applies in Scotland. The Scottish Food Standards Organisation has also agreed to do the same. So this is a UK thing. Now, thankfully, we don't end up in the coroner's court very often, but there is one case which I think is important to mention that 
rarely, in fact, this is unique as far as I know, if you have a young fit adult and they have an allergic reaction and they have a cardiac arrest, they can be resuscitated. And sadly, in this case, this young lady who went to Budapest and probably ate nuts um, was resuscitated, but you can see that she had been brain damaged and she now has lifelong care needs following her allergic reaction. And I think that's a consideration. Most reactions are mild. The ones that become more serious, even they tend to resolve. Rarely do people die, but just occasionally we can end up with a scenario like this. So I have an interest in the law relating to food allergy, and I have collected a series of cases, which I'm waiting to get my collaborator to publish with me. Um, but these are the typical penalties. So businesses might be fined and have to pay costs and compensation. Um, in some cases, they haven't actually got any money. There's some very, very um, sh sort of shoestring uh, businesses that really don't have a lot of money. And if they end up um, causing somebody to have a reaction, they perhaps might have a community order. There are a few people, I think there are probably about four or five people in jail or have been in jail recently, um, and also somebody who was uh, curfewed and tagged as part of their punishment for an allergy um, incident. And in addition, people might make a civil claim, so they might say, look, you've, you've made me poorly and I've had a week off work and uh, etc. so please pay me some money. And also reputational damage on social media. You might have a bad report or TripAdvisor or somebody say, look, I went to so-and-so last night and I had a reaction. This is me in hospital and this is caused by this business. And of course, they may have loss of business, so loss of trade and also actually lose their business because they um, have lost the trust of their customers. So lastly, just to point out that food allergens in food are highly regulated. Food allergens in non-foods are not re regulated in the same way. Whose idea was it to put almond oil in fabric conditioner? So that's one place you might encounter food allergens that you didn't expect. Milk in soap or coconut oil in loo roll. And in that moment when you're looking for the loo roll, you might not be considering the food allergens. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hazel. Um, if you stop sharing, then we can just have a chat. And that was amazing. Um, I've got loads of questions, obviously, and, and even more than we've got. Um, it, it, it was really, it's, it's quite traumatic for me as well um, because my youngest nearly died twice. So yeah, so I, I don't talk about it too much. Um, but one of the first questions we have is what can we do, and this must have happened to somebody else, until paramedics arrive if we know someone is having a severe food reaction, um, but we didn't know about EpiPens or anything else. Okay. Well, it's worth trying to find out if they've got anything with them, whether they've got an EpiPen or two. Um, in the community, as they call it, you know, in real life, has anybody else got one? Because that would be worth finding out. Um, it, it's, um, what's it called? Good Samaritan, isn't it? Where you, where you try and save somebody's life. Um, first of all, you make sure that the, you, ideally you've got two people to help, but you make sure that the paramedics are going to find you. So you send somebody to the gate or whatever, make sure that they've got the right postcode and all the rest of it. Um, have they got any medication on them? If they've got asthma, then at least you can give them an air inhaler. Keep them really calm and make sure that they don't stand up and move around too much. That posture is really important. And it's not instinctive to lie down when you're in a flap and you're worried. It's not instinctive. You have to actually be told to get your head and heart level and your knees up, but that's actually what you should be doing if you're, especially if you're in any risk of losing consciousness. 
Yeah, I, I remember that quite well. And I think maybe look for maybe any medical leaflet they've got on them or sort of medical yeah. alert. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Um, you, you talked about peanuts, uh, legumes, which was really interesting. And I, I find that really interesting because I know they, they do that intolerance desensitization, which you were saying. I've been brought up on peanut butter and I brought my children up on peanut butter. And when I was tested in London Hospital for Allergies, they said it was a very good idea that I brought my children up on peanut butter from day one. So, um, and I had no idea about that because they were convinced they would be allergic to that instead of all the other bits, but peanut allergies in everything, isn't it? Seems to be. Um, the peanuts and the flour. Can someone um, develop tolerance to them by just introducing minute quantities? And I think you touched on that yourself, but it would be under medical care. I would want that under medical care, really. Um, I mean, for little children in weaning, I'll tell you, I could probably send you a link actually for those people who are interested. Um, Allergy UK have got a, a very, very um, comprehensive uh, PDF guide that you can download and a kind of top level simple guide. This is all about um, weaning, early introduction, um, generally for all children and then for high risk children. So Allergy UK website, look for that because that's really the best place. But I I, I mean, I, I'm, it's irrelevant to me in my life now, but if I um, if I had a baby that was high risk for allergic disease, I would be wanting the best guidance on early introduction as possible. And would that be for every food? Um, or just... Well, the thing is that the sensible thing is that you do it for the foods that are in your family's diet, because, you know, that's so. So you do it with the food that's around. So if my dad had done peanut butter, that would have been you know great news I wouldn't be doing this now would I but uh, there's no point in, I mean in America they are now looking for commercial opportunities to market um, a weaning food which contains the 14 allergens for example and the point about that is that if you're not going to eat lupin then there's not much point in feeding your baby with lupin you just let them kind of you know through the natural order of life they might encounter it eventually um so but the most important thing is that the main allergens that are in your family's regular world um should be eaten by your baby because the risk is that they will be sensitized to them if they don't eat them obviously they've got to be in a form that are safe for a baby so in a you know in a non-choking form but you don't need to desensitize them or, or to protect them from everything, only the things that you're likely to have in your diet. And that's why if you come from a community where uh, there's a lot of legume consumption, you know, lots of chapatis, mung beans, for example, or, or you know, different um, foods that are eaten in different communities, then those are the foods that you need to feed to your baby. Great, thank you. Um, and I think you touched on this as well, bee stings. You can't you can't desensitize to that. If you swell uh, up, uh, you, you can desensitize to bee sting. Um, when I I had desensitization for some of the pollens at guys, and there was a lady having bee, uh, bee sting desensitization. It's a program of injections, so it can be done. There's there's no. There's no obvious overlap between the people who have food allergy and the people who have sting allergy or drug allergy. There's not any correlation. There are different populations. I mean, you might get people who are in both, but generally speaking, there's. No, but the people who've got hay fever have a massive correlation with the people with food allergy. Ah, uh, okay. Yes, that rings a bell. I'm with you on the older catkin at the moment as well. Yes. Um, if you start fizzing on the lips, you touched on this with your pyramid. Eating fruit, is it a sign it could get worse? But I think you sort of touched on that before. The, there is there is this thing which I didn't go into in enough, enough depth, but um, 
if you look up something called oral allergy syndrome or food pollen syndrome, that is to do with cross reactivity. Now, it's a long story, but the birch pollen sensitive people, for example, um, some of them have what you might call localized oral reactions. So in the mouth, you get tingling with certain foods. And the foods that are often cited are raw apple, uh, raw celery or celeriac, raw carrot, and certain berries and cherries and things like that. Now, many of them are, are, have proteins which are a little bit weedier, if you like, than the than the nut storage proteins, which are kind of tough and hardy and have to get through the winter and so on. Um, so these slightly weedier proteins um, will be broken by the um, enzymes in the mouth. So generally speaking, that mouth digestion is enough to knock them out and you can get away with it. And some people will have a tingle and will have nasty symptoms, bit of a bother, but actually they carry on eating it because they like the food, maybe, I don't know. Um, but it's called food pollen syndrome. And if you look it up, you can have a lot more information about that. It's a sort of a cross reactivity with pollens. That's really, I'm definitely gonna look that up, thank you. Um, you've touched on this before. Why is it that often I've been told a cake or biscuit are nut free, but then find it has almond flour in it? Well, uh, yeah, I work with caterers and I listen to caterers and I have been in a court where somebody had died and the caterer was swearing that almond wasn't a nut and people just, if it doesn't look like a nut because it's in a ground form, people just get blockages. Right. Um, it's interesting because my children are tree nut allergy, um, very severe, but not to almonds. Yeah, because my youngest at 15, 14 um, teenager wanted to try out things, wanted to. And I think that maybe is the issue, you know, they're going out more, yeah, yeah, yeah. trying it. And also um, he used to come back and say, I don't think I'm allergic anymore. And I'll go, yeah. what have you done? <laughs> no, that's absolutely right. And of course, when I was a kid, I kind of learned um, there was nobody allergic. Nobody was living the life that I was yeah, living. Yeah, yeah. It was really unusual. I mean, I had to wait till I was about 18 before I found somebody else with a nut allergy. Um, I, there was hardly anybody with asthma as well, when, you know, not that I knew about. But the thing is that nowadays, uh, the if you're under the care of a good allergy clinic, then they will try and get all the nuts into your diet that you're not allergic to for your protection. So they'll actively encourage consumption. And that's where you will need each nut in its own form without cross-contamination from the others. Now I know that Brazil nut is probably one of my worst, but I think I'm less susceptible. I mean, I, I avoid them all very well, of course, but I suspect that if I ate hazelnut by mistake, I would not have such a bad reaction as if I eat Brazil nut. I'm not going to try it it's just too high risk especially with covid and everything else around but nowadays children are encouraged to eat all the nuts that they are not actually allergic to actively by their clinics okay yes okay i'm feeling a bit stressed by that already um what about so a lot of children that i know and in my family um maybe autistic uh, are very um, little so reading the label may contain is very difficult because the diet is already quite narrow exactly. and then you read that and then you wonder why you know there isn't much food to eat at all and and I just wonder if that causes more issues with food allergy uh, food phobia if you like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it does it does uh, there's a lot of psychological research now on the load on families, even when you haven't got other conditions to con consider as well. Um, the stress, the guilt, you know, if I'd done this when I was pregnant, then I wouldn't have had this. And if I'd given them that, you know, the, all the, the thinking that goes on and the, and the disputes in families, you know, the tensions, uh, you know, 
you can, you know, you used to eat it. Why can't your child eat it? You know, all that sort of stuff, yeah. which is really, really difficult. Um, it's very difficult because may contain is the most gray thing that there is. And yet you're trying to deal with it in a black and white way on a label. You know, it's yes or no, and it's not yes or no at all. I have my own rules and occasionally I might break them. Um, but my own rules particularly avoid chocolate, which, and I see there's some discussion about milk in the chat. Milk in chocolate factories is very likely to be may contain, it's, it's almost impossible to get dark chocolate um, without milk. I think the only company that I know is Nomo, I'm not sure about that, but um, may contain milk because of what happens in chocolate factories is a big issue. May contain nuts is a big issue. Uh, there's very little, well, I can eat things like Smarties and so on, but uh, grown up chocolate you can't get. Um, so I'm very cautious about chocolate. I'm very cautious about anything baked, you know, cereals and so on, especially in store bakeries. That's where I would also be quite strict. But these rules are built on a lifetime of experience and also quite a lot of insight of what happens in the food industry, which of course normal people are not, you know, necessarily going to be privileged to. And um, uh, also things do change. So there's push, there's push for regulation of may contain, but we do need, um, we need a lot more understanding really. There, there's a lot of good practice, which makes a lot of food safer than it would otherwise be, but it's a perennial problem. And um, there's a question here, what three words app helps paramedics find you? Um, don't know if you want to I, 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 I have just about heard of what three words. So, I mean, you need, you need anaphylaxis. Um, I don't know. I'm, I don't know how exactly it works. So I'm not sure what to say. Yeah. Okay, maybe we can come back to that and we'll post it. We'll find out. Thank you. Um, Auto injectors have a shelf life. So remember to check them. Yes, I know. <laughs> and also they have to be the right um, size for the weight. So when your child is above 30 kilos, do you need to get the bigger ones? And well, they're there... not bigger. Is there a, a needle length as well? Is there a... Yeah, there is. It's a bit contentious. Um, Sorry. The EpiPen and the Jext are, I think the Jext is 15 mil, the EpiPen is 16 mil. The doctors, are, there's a new paper only just come out this week, actually, which I've put on my, um, on my Twitter account, um, because the other auto injector which is available in the UK is called Emirate and that has a 25 mil so like two and a half centimeters needle and the doctors will debate whether the needle has to go through a layer called the fascia which is a sort of like a, a gristle <laughs> for want to a better word you know a sort of muscular layer and some people think that it it, you can get enough adrenaline without doing that and some people think that you really do need to get it in past that and obviously if you've got um if you're a little bit curvy even if you're not actually you know overweight or obese um the position of the injection site and getting the needle through this fascia are things that might not be the same for everybody so it's one of these things that's put uh, being discussed there has been this new paper this week if you're interested in that subject yeah yes definitely and we'll get all your links and post them at the end as well for everybody okay, okay i think we've just about come to the end i know um the natasha's law is coming into um yes, it's october the first yeah. i should have said that yes okay so i just thought i'd say that and it was an awful um, we, we'd, we've been doing experience days at the airport and, um, you know, allergies always come up, airborne and so on, but um, actually on the airplane, it's always an issue with peanuts, you know, being delivered out and, and now this, so I, that can only be good. I, I can't believe they're still giving what they were when they were flying. Um, if you don't carry an EpiPen, perhaps you haven't described one, what's the next best thing? Well, 
all the guidelines are pushing towards carrying adrenaline. Yeah. That's that's really what you need to do. If you're asthmatic and you've got a ventilator, it might help keep your airways open, but really you need adrenaline. That's the clinical remedy for that issue. Okay, thank you. Just a couple more is um, someone went to a restaurant to check uh, on ingredients and because they like to and they were autistic and the waiter passed them a huge folder yeah literally of a for a very ingredient um and their child was in their element because they loved reading it all but for anybody else <laughs> well also uh it is i mean obviously we're not really doing this at the minute you know with the yeah. way we're living at the minute and and i think things are going to perhaps move on um but certainly since 2014 so that's seven years now when the law changed and they had to give you the information um there's nothing worse than a being given a really grubby folder that's sort of all sticky and yuck you know because that's not what you want you don't, you don't want to go that's such a good point oh my gosh but, yeah but also you know it's july and they've still got christmas in there and you're going really is this actually can i trust this you know is it reliable so accessing the information is a legal requirement if you think that a business is not doing the job properly then report them to your local council you know the environmental health or the trading standards and just say look i you know i'm not sure that they really are on top of this but um relying on i mean sometimes they have you know the, the chain restaurants have got standard uh oh, what's called menus with ingredients and so on and they tend to have that information accessible but uh, yeah certainly being given a folder uh, is as you say <laughs> it's it's very interesting if you're interested in that kind of thing but actually they're often flawed as well and certainly they can be just a bit grubby yeah that's a really good point and i remember with those sad cases um the the advice at one point was to go into a busy restaurant and actually ask what the ingredients were but for someone who is neurodivergent that's the last thing yeah. you want to do yeah. you just want to buy it and go so that that was something that i talked about quite a lot and i think the social aspect the social environment you talked about was was really key because a lot of families don't invite you if, yeah. because you're different or they're scared of you and if you've got other things yeah. going on i know personally it was really isolating for yeah. myself and my children they weren't invited because people were scared I think the other thing that happens is that sometimes people try really hard for you. They they want to include you. They try really hard, but they actually get it wrong. And then you have to say, do you know, it's very kind of you, but I can't eat that thing that you've got specially in for me. And that's that takes massive courage that you have to overcome so much to be able to just say that. Yeah, that's a really good point. I used to train uh, or delegates uh, I had someone come up to me afterwards and he was in tears because we talked about food allergies a little bit and his it had been worked out that his child couldn't eat rice and that was their main staple yeah, yeah. and it was you know their culture yeah, yeah it yeah. was devastating and um but I didn't know quite what to say really at that point I've got another, one last question from a patient's point of view, what are the differences between an allergy and an intolerance? And what are the differences in how they're managed and treated? I think you touched on it a little bit. Yeah, um, I mean, essentially allergy of the kind that I have that you've already talked about, the what's called the IgE mediated, the immunoglobin E mediated allergy is the kind that where your immune system is sensitized and if your immune system then has antibodies which encounter the allergen, then that can trigger the same sort of response with the systemic response, which affects you know, the skin, the breathing, et cetera, where it's basically your body going into an emergency scenario and trying to protect the organs by releasing fluid into uh, from the circulation to go and do other jobs. Um, and that release of fluid makes the jeopardizes the blood pressure and the circulation 
and also creates swelling, which of course, if it happens in your throat, means that you're um, not necessarily going to be able to breathe. The mechanisms for different kinds of intolerances and also non-IG mediated allergy are quite different and they're not my top expertise at all, but yeah. there is information available about them. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for everybody for joining.